Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site. And this video is about the 737 rudder story. So in this video I'll be explaining the rudder issues that besieged the 737 in the, in the early 1990s. I'll take you through the accidents, investigations, the contrasting opinions, design changes and the many QRH changes that the 737 rudder system has gone through. It all started with two mysterious accidents in the early 1990s for which no conclusive evidence was ever found. I'll also explain how these events led to a complete reformat of the QRH, the introduction of upset recovery training and FDR improvements. So let's start at the beginning with the first accident. Um, this was to United Airways 585 at Colorado Springs in March 1991. Throughout this presentation I'll be referring back to this timeline um, so you can see we, we were starting here at, uh, at the Colorado Springs accident March 1991 taking you right right through to 2003 and in fact beyond that which gives you an idea of how 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 long the the, the investigation and the, and, the, and, the, and the story is. So, uh, on the 3rd of March 1991, a 737-200, um, N999UA, was turning onto final approach at 155 knots at Colorado Springs. Rotor clouds have been observed and vertical wind speeds of up to 1,000 feet per minute have been reported. The aircraft suddenly rolled to the right at about 5 degrees a second and pitch nose down. The aircraft impacted the ground almost vertically and all 25 persons on board were killed. Six days before the accident, the aircraft had had an uncommanded in-flight rudder deflection. The crew switched off the yaw damper and the aircraft returned to normal flight. The engineers replaced the, the yaw damper coupler and a similar event occurred two days later and the yaw damper transfer valve in the main power control unit uh, which I'll call the PCU hereafter, was changed. Several flights have been made since that last replacement without incident. It took about uh, over 18 months um, for, for that report to be published by the NTSB. The, the, there were a number of reasons for that, but, um, but mostly it, it was due to a lack of data. The investigation was inconclusive and um, w what they said in the, the probable cause was that although anomalies were found in the airplane's rudder system, none would have produced a rudder movement that could not easily be encountered by the airplane's lateral controls. So the aircraft did enter a rotor, However, the FDR didn't conclusively support the encounter of a vortex of the strength necessary to control to cause an uncontrollable roll of the aircraft. The NTSB issued four recommendations uh, with that report, and they, they were related to, to checking and redesigning the main rudder PCU servo valve. Um, one to check the input shaft for, for gold standby rudder actuator bearings, and the other two were, were about developing a broader meteorological aircraft hazard program for airports in or near mountainous terrain. So uh, again, you know, the, 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 there was nothing conclusive, conclusive found here. Um, so the, the recommendations were, were, were really pitched at uh, best guess, you know, but based on the, the accident aircraft's, you know, immediate uh, maintenance history, you know, pr prior to the accident and the, the observation of rotor clouds. Um, now, one of the things they, uh, that the NTSB found was uh, evidence of galling on the, the actuator bearings of the, of the standby rudder input shaft. Now, um, the galling, if, 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 I say if, um, un unless you're an engineer, you're probably not familiar with the term. Um, uh, now, there's a photograph of it there, courtesy of Wikipedia, but um, it, it's a typical example of, of, of galling. This, in this case, it's on a bolt. Um, probably where the nut was attached to that, which which has caused that um, distortion of the of the thread on the the, the bolt in in this picture. I so say it, it wasn't a bolt that that 
that was you know that that was found gold on the on the 737. This is just a, a, a generic example of what galling is. So it, it's defined as a condition whereby contact forces between mating surfaces produce a localized welding and and transfer of material, uh, which leads to a roughening of each surface. Now the presence of galling, I w you know why it's such a big issue, is that it could cause two surfaces to to bind. And and that's that's the problem. So if you're thinking of a rudder input shaft, if that were to bind, that would lead to a jam in the um, in in the rudder. You know, theoretically, I say that there, there was no no evidence that 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 was what happened. Um, so um, the NTSB made a recommendation in 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 the report, which was issued late '92, to check the the standby rudder input shaft for gold actuator bearings, um, and. An AD for that was not actually issued uh, for almost six years until January 1998, which kind of sets the tone for the whole investigation and 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 the whole getting to the bottom of of what happened. It, you know that the whole thing really moved at glacial speed um, for for such a potentially serious event. And I said that there were many many reasons for this. You know, not least of which was the the inability to to find any hard evidence as, as, as to what happened to, to the aircraft. Anyway, um, let's talk about the uh, the original 737 rudder system. Um, it was essentially unchanged, the, the, the design of it, um, since the initial design of the early 1960s. Um, and it was actually a similar design to um, to the 707. It, it, it was actually a a bit different to the 727 because the 727 had a split rudder, uh, the 73 and the 70 didn't, um, and it'd been functioning without any problems, really of any significance at all, um, until th this incident in 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 '91. So it it had had actually quite a good track record. Um, so if we look in detail at what we've got, um, the, the, there's, there's a diagram down there which shows it you, and I'll, I'll take you through that in a second. Well, basically this system was the same on um, originals and classics, so the, the 100 through to the 500 series. And it used cables and linkages to, to take inputs from rudder pedals uh, to, to the input torque tube. That has, has then got two input rods connected to two separate power control units, the, the main one and the standby one. So if I label this all up so, so you can see it, um, starting with the, the pilot input, rudder pedal input, you know, we're, we're, we're at the front at the pointy end, um, put the rudder pedal input in, that then goes down a pair of transmission rods uh, and then across, the, well, toward, toward, toward the back uh, along another pair of transmission rods. Um, to and and the, the the FO side and the and the captain side are connected by a bus rod at the back there. So w whatever he does, you you know your pedals move in 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 sympathy with his inputs and 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 vice versa. So um, so the bus rod ties the, the the captains and the FO side together. The inputs though from the transmission rods go to these qu pair of quadrants. Um, and they move, they push or pull the, the, um, a pair of cables that take the inputs all the way down to the tail. Now these cables, I haven't shown a photo here, but if you look back at um, my flight controls videos, I, I, the, the, I forget which one it's in, but it, 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 possibly in all three, um, you can see these cables under the floorboards of the, of the aircraft. They run the whole length of the aircraft. Um, the, the, there's at least a dozen cables for, for, for various systems. Um, but, you know, tr tried and tested uh, system. Um, it'll certainly work in the event of an, an electric or hydraulic failure, uh, which, which is good. So those cables run, say, all the way down to the back, uh, to the aft quadrant, which is in the, 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 the fin of the, um, of the aircraft. The aft quadrant rotates in response to the cable input, which then moves the aft transmission rod. The aft transmission rod is connected to this vertical input torque tube, so there's a lug on the side. As the aft transmission rod goes forward and back, the input torque tube rotates clockwise or anti-clockwise. 
that's got a, a pair of lugs on it which are attached to these uh, input rods the, the, the two things shown in red. The bottom one's the main PCU input rod which uh, which gives the inputs to the, the main PCU and the, the upper one is the standby PCU input rod for the standby PCU. So what what's the PCU? The, 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 the PCU uh, power control unit, the, this is the thing that converts our rudder pedal inputs with with the force we can apply to it it converts that in, into hydraulic pressure to move the rudder and that's necessary because the rudder's deflected into an airflow of anything up to 340 knots. Um, you couldn't really do it with rudder pedal input al alone, certainly not in an engine out situation where, where you need full rudder. So, um, so that's why they're, they're, they're hydraulically powered and that's done through these, uh, these PCUs at the back. Now the area of interest uh, in the rudder system for this presentation is basically everything aft of that aft transmission rod. Uh, all the stuff that's in the tail. Um, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. Because all the stuff at the front works absolutely fine. And uh, you know has, has worked perfectly since the 60s and up to the present day. So it's just the stuff at the back we're going to be looking at. This is a photo of the uh, the base of the fin of a 737 with uh, with um, the panels removed, just to kind of put into pictures what 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 you saw in the diagram. So you can see the cables coming up and, and across from the rudder pedals. They go around various pulleys to change the the direction of the cables, and they finish up at the um, the aft rudder quadrant, uh, which which rotates passing the, uh, the 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 input to the transmission rod goes through the field and centering unit up to the input torque tube and then across the uh, the input rods into the into the PCUs so that that's what it looks like in real life um, a close-up view of the PCU is is here this is actually on the other side uh, from the one in the previous photo it's it, the same PCU but just looked from the the starboard side in, 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 instead the port side um, so the input rods are on the other side that that's why they're not visible in this photo and you can see there up at the top uh, the the hydraulic system a and b flow and return lines which is why there are four of those um, again over on the right hand side they, they, that that's where the PCU is attached to the spar of the of the uh, of the fin um, and at the other end is the piston which is attached to the rudder and in the middle you've got the PCU housing itself and that contains a servo valve which is, is the thing that converts the inputs from the rods into hydraulic pressure to the PCU piston. Right, at the heart of the, uh, of the PCU is um, or was until 2002, a dual concentric servo valve. Um, this basically takes the the inputs from the uh, from the input rods, which which internally uh, through those levers near the top left of the of the diagram, move um, two concentric slides. In, in the servo valve and in doing so that regulates hydraulic system A or B fluid to the tandem rudder actuator to hydraulically extend or retract the piston rod uh, thereby moving the rudder left or right of centre. So the, the, the actual heart of the, of the whole system is this this dual concentric servo valve, and as I say, it, it, it's got two sliders which move, and, and through these various labyrinths, uh, they allow hydraulic pressure to, to, to pass or not pass, thereby moving the, um, the, 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 the rudder piston rod. In addition to, to rudder pedal inputs, um, which follow the path that I, that I showed you uh, in, in the previous slides, the main PCU also takes yaw damper inputs in the form of electrical signals from the, the yaw damper coupler, which, which is located in the e &E bay. Um, and I explain this, this component in, in more detail in the, the flight controls yaw video. Um, and where it might be located in the e and EB bay video. But anyway, the, the, the signals come electrically from that to the main PCU yaw damper solenoid valve. 
and that sends hydraulic system B pressure to move the yaw damper actu actuator. And that yaw damper actuator, the, 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 the input um, is, it, it mechanically adds to the to the pilot input via summing levers, and you can see those near, near the top of the the diagram, where I've drawn two arrows coming down from the uh, from the yaw damper area. So I, again, it's it's all all good mechanical stuff. Um, <laughs> very little to to to, to go wrong. Um, and those summing levers, they connect to the end of the dual concentric servo valve, which move the PCU piston and, and the rudder. Now, in normal operation, um, the inner and the outer slides have, have got channels uh, in, in, in the slides. So, so the, the, they're basically drilled out. And, and, and in those channels, they, they will allow hydraulic fluid to flow or, or stop as the slide moves within the, the, the valve body, that hydraulic uh, flow will, will thereby move the rudder actuator. If you push the inner slide into the outer slide, that will move the rudder left. Pulling it from the outer slide, that will move the rudder right. Um, probably worth noting that in normal rudder operation, only the inner slide moves as, as only partial hydraulic pressure is required to move the, uh, the rudder. Okay, so let's have a look at um, a failure mode. Um, now, although the first United 585 report said that no anomalies um, would have produced the rudder movement that could not have been easily countered by the air airplane's lateral controls, the investigation did identify a number of possible failure modes of the main PCU servo valve. And these failure modes basically involved jamming of um, the, the secondary slide against the housing, housing leading to an over travel of the of the primary slide and that could cause a rudder hard over or worse still a uh, a rudder reversal hard over so you you know you, you've got these two moving components inside a housing you know the primary slide and the secondary slide you could get a a a, a jamming of either the primary and the secondary or the secondary and the housing or possibly a multiple jam of the primary and the secondary. These were all things that, that were looked at by the, the investigation team. Um, it was also a hard over scenario, and, and this could possibly occur if, if either a pilot and or the yaw damper um, commanded a rudder deflection and the outer slide jammed against the valve body and the inner slide jammed against the outer slide. So we're, we're we're deep into the world of multiple failures here, which which is you know not normally considered by the, the authorities in in certification. Um, but if that scenario were to happen, then hydraulic fluid would continue to flow, pushing the rudder actuator to its full extent. Now, possible causes of these multiple jams could be either debris in the hydraulic fluid causing binding. Um, a momentary misalignment of the slides, uh, you know, that would really have to be due to some sort of bending motion of the um, of, of the unit, um, or a sudden change in fluid temperature causing the the, the slides to expand and, and and stick in the in the housing or or in each other. So they're, they're you know possible scenarios for this. Um, there's also a, a reversal uh, hard over scenario. Now, that, th this could possibly occur if, if either a pilot and or the yaw damper commanded a rapid rudder deflection and the spring guide uh, and end cap were out of alignment, which is shown over there on the right-hand side of the diagram. This could allow the outer slide to move too far, thereby channeling hydraulic fluid in the opposite direction to, to that intended. Again, the, the, these these were all theoretical failures. Again, I should say nothing was ever found in in the um, in, in in the wreckage of the PCO. And the PCO was recovered, and I've 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 seen the um, uh, the the breakdown report of it, and you know it was all found to be working pretty much normally. Um, now I'm conscious of the fact that the people of uh, um, of of varying levels of technical knowledge non-pilots and non-native English speakers watch these videos. So let, let, let's quickly just explain the term rudder reversal. 
Normally, when you press the left rudder pedal, the rudder moves to the left. When you press the right rudder pedal, the, the rudder deflects to the right. With the reversal, the opposite is true. So if you press the left rudder pedal, the rudder will deflect to the right. Now, in the reversal scenario, uh, a pilot pushing on one rudder pedal would cause opposite rudder deflection. What's more, the harder you pushed on the pedal, the more the pedal would push back, likely leading to the pilot's push even harder. So, you know, it, it, it makes it worse. Um, ironically, if the pilot were to do something that was counterintuitive, I relax the pressure to, and, and the investigation subsequently revealed it could be something less than 50 pounds force, the rudder might return to the normal neutral position. Um, but the chance of, you know, anybody having the, um, the, the 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 were all the foresight to, to do that in a in an emergency I, w I would suggest would be pretty low so let's just have a look at how this dual concentric ser servo valve got certified um, now according to transcripts of meetings attended by the FAA and Boeing um, from May 1965 FAA certification personnel raised questions about the um, about the 737 one and 200 certification process about this uh, single panel power actuated rudder design and at the time Boeing stated that redundancy was provided by the dual concentric PCU servo valve and the dual low path design of the rudder actuator system so that so there was built-in redundancy um, b b both in the path to the, the servo valve and within the servo valve it, it itself. And, and Boeing s stated that the, the servo valve assembly was designed to accommodate a, a single jam, be it either primary slide to secondary slide or the secondary slide to housing, without resulting in loss of control of the PCU, because if either primary or the secondary were to jam, the other slide would still move uh, to counteract the jamming and, and connect the proper f hydraulic flow paths to command rudder movement in the intended direction. I mean, you wouldn't get full, you know, hydraulic pressure, but you would get plenty and certainly enough for normal operation. So the uh, the dual concentric servo valve was, um, I mean, you, you, what one view is it's overly complicated. Another view is that it's... Um, it, it's very clever because it it, it can accommodate it you know it, it, it can handle a single jam that's kind of why it was designed that way um, so it was considered to be a you know <laughs> a very good thing at the time with lots of advantages but as I say unfortunately um, it, it, it it's believed it was the the culprit so um, looking back at the history of the uh, the rudder um, according to Boeing from as of 1991, uh, the 737 had flown about 50 million hours since its first flight in 1967. And in that time, uh, Boeing showed that there had been just six confirmed PCU jams, four of which resulted in um, a rudder jam or hard over incident, and the other two were, uh, were discovered during maintenance. The investigations of those events showed the causes to be internal contamination of, or in one case corrosion of, the main PCU dual concentric servo valve. So there kind of was a precedent that the dual concentric servo valve could create a jam because it had done so in the past. But obviously those jams had, had, had never resulted in, in any, um, any, any loss of control. So in 1991, um, which, as a reminder, was was the year that uh, United 585 went down, Boeing and, and, and Parker Hannafin, who, who the manufacturer of the of the valve, um, in in response to to, to the event and uh, you know the history, started redesigning this this dual servo valve to to prevent over travel of the secondary slide. Um, which would eliminate a rudder hard over or reversal. The redesign was completed uh, 1998, so it took them seven years, um, but but they got it done. Um, 
and what it did was it, it lengthened the primary and secondary slides by about half an inch, modified the, the end cap of the servo valve and moved the, the flow port pathways uh, further apart and the, and, and the metering edges further apart so that if a secondary slide were to jam to the, uh, to the valve ho housing, over travel of the primary slide wouldn't connect the ports that could cause hydraulic flow and, and, and reverse operation. Um, these design changes became mandated in, um, in, in 1998 with, with AD 9714-04. So um, let's have a look at the first ADs then. Um, these kicked off in 94, so three years after the, uh, the Colorado Springs accident, there, there, there was a, a flurry of, of ADs. Um, there were a total of nine um, issued from, from 94 to 97 for the rudder system. And the first three of them all related to, to this servo valve. So the first one was a leak test, um, which had to be done every 750 hours until the, 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 um, the, the new servo valve was, uh, was designed. Um, the, the second one again was 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 looking at repair stations for the PCUs and the, and the the last one there was was basically requiring inspection intervals um, of of every two hundred and fifty flight hours uh, to make sure the PCU was behaving correctly. Then in September ninety four, uh, tragically there was a second accident and this was US four two seven at Pittsburgh. So, 8th of September 94, three and a half years after United 585, US Air Flight 427, and this was 737-300, remember uh, Colorado Springs was 200, uh, was approaching Pittsburgh. It was just over four miles behind a 727, um, and it was at 6,000 feet, flap 1190. US 427 entered the wake turbulence of the 727 whilst it was rolling out of a left turn. Three sudden thumps were heard on the CVR and the aircraft rolled to the left. One second later clicking sounds and a louder thump were heard, after which the aircraft rolled further to the left. Kinematic analyses of the FDR showed that there was a sustained full rudder deflection to the left and full aft control column input. Um, that led to a stall. The aircraft crashed just 28 seconds after the wake encounter and all 132 persons on board died. Absolutely tragic. So a, um, a critical design review was, was launched um, very soon after, after Pittsburgh, the, the following month in fact. Um, and as you can see, that took uh, almost a year to um, to conclude. So, six weeks after um, Pittsburgh, the FAA's Transport Aircraft Directorate began a critical design review of the, uh, of the 737 flight control system, with an emphasis on roll control and directional flight control systems. The CDR was conducted by a team of seven flight control system specialists, uh, not only from the, the FAA, but also, they also invited in Transport Canada and the US Air Force to, uh, to try and get some you know, f fresh minds and independence on the, um, on, the, on the task. After seven months, they published the report in May 95. Unfortunately, the results were inconclusive. Um, I know specific scenarios were identified that could explain either of the accidents. However, it did make 27 recommendations for FAA action uh, from developing national policies such as upset recovery training um, to reviewing the adequacy of existing policies to taking appropriate action on specific 737 rudder issues. And the last recommendation was, in, in my opinion, absolutely outstanding, and it was to request the NTSB to form a special accident investigation team to begin a new combined investigation of both this, the Colorado Springs and the Pittsburgh accidents. Obviously, because they, you know, they, they thought the, the the circumstances between the two were so similar, 
and um, you know really they, they should be treated almost as, as one event. Now they went further than that they said that the accident investigation team should include an FAA representative from the CDR team and the NTSB aviation safety investigator that worked with the CDR team. That will ensure that all the data from the CDR is available for review by the accident investigation team. It's further recommendation that NTSB personnel on the team not be from the original accident investigation teams and that the NTSB include at least two accident investigators, one from uh, aircraft systems and flight operation, another competent from another competent aviation authority of the world who's got experience of, with the 737 aircraft. So they're, they're, they're trying to compile here the, the, the best, most independent, freshest um, minds to, to try and solve these two uh, accidents um, to, to, together. So, um, you know, a, 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 great, a great initiative. Um, right. Next event was in October '95 when uh, Boeing issued an article on the yaw damper. Uh, th this this came, I say, about six months after the CDR report was published. Uh, so obviously Boeing were feeling the, the the need to respond to 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 what was going on here. Um, so in October '95 they, they they published this and it was a seven page article. So it was, it was quite a chunky one. Um, in the Airliner magazine. Now, th those of you not familiar with Airliner magazine, it's it's not commercially available, um, but Boeing produce you know tens of, you know of uh, possibly hundreds of thousands of copies of these, and they've done so since the 1950s, I think, late 50s. Um, it's now called Aero Magazine, um, and, and the, you know they still have it in a slightly different form, and and they they give these out to to airlines to disseminate down to their crews. Um, in fairness, most crew hardly ever get to see the original document. They're usually hoovered up by by the you know the the fleet managers and tech captains, and 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 they then you know read them and take out what information they need and. Um, disseminate it in a, uh, in a in a more pilot friendly way down to the the crews on the line. Um, but that that's what Airline Magazine is, and um, it, it, you know it's it, it was a very detailed article. I mean, it, it, it's probably still available on the internet. The, the reference is down there at the bottom. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's available if if you, if you want to read it. Um, and it's, it says there that, that uh, the article has discussed the 737 flight control system, particularly the rudder, yaw damper and autopilot systems and associated yaw damper failure modes. It's also reviewed the proper pilot actions in the event of an uncommanded yaw or roll. Worst case, yaw damper system malfunctions are easily controllable. So really, the, Boeing, you know, it, it issued this article um, because of a belief that your damper malfunctions or, or any or uncommanded your role events were, were being incorrectly handled by crew. Um, whose fault that is? Well, I, obviously being crew, um, I would tend to say if 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 we're not trained for it or how to do it, how um, how can we stand the fighting chance? Um, anyway, I say the the information came down from Boeing in the form of this article and um, flight ops departments for airlines around the world uh, presumably got on and trained their crew for the, such eventualities. Then came Flight Eastwind 517 in, uh, in June 96. So this was, uh, it was about two years after Pittsburgh. 9th of June, 96, Eastwind 517, which was a 737-200, experienced two hard rudder deflections at 250 knots as it was approaching Richmond. The crew managed to recover the aircraft. Boeing found that the yaw damper had been misrigged and did a flight test with the, with the captain of the, the incident flight and a Boeing test pilot to replicate the event. The captain apparently was, was unconvinced <laughs> that... Uh, that this was the cause, saying that his incident had been much stronger than than that shown on the test flight. But um, anyway, uh, post accident, uh, sorry, post incident, because there was no accident. Um, fortunately, post incident examination of the aircraft's maintenance records 
reveal three flight crew reported rudder-related events during, during the month preceding the incident. So again, you could argue that the writing was on the roll here, that, uh, that, that, that something was going to happen. Fortunately, the crew got away with it. Um, at which point, the NTSB decided to intervene. So in October 96, which was uh, just a few months after Eastwind 517, um, and almost three years before the the final report of, of US 427 would be concluded, the NTSB, having identified safety issues with the uh, with the 737, issued 13 more safety recommendations in light of, as they put it, numerous uncommanded role in your events involving the 737 series. So good on them. They 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 they, they knew the their uh, investigation was not complete. However, they had enough circumstantial evidence to go on that, that the 737 was having all kinds of um, role in your events and, you know, something needed to, 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 to be done. Um, a little extract from that is is uh, is given there. And, uh, it says, low comprehensive testing and examinations have not identified any anomalies with either uh, accident aircraft flight control systems or components that could have caused the accidents. The safety board has identified safety issues involving the 737 that need to be addressed by the FAA to improve the safety of the aircraft. They um, they issued 13 new recommendations. Uh, these all related to the design and maintenance of the rudder system, particularly the, uh, the PCU's dual concentric servo valve and the introduction of a specific QRH procedure to be used in the event of an uncommanded rudder movement. The recommendations uh, were directed to Boeing for implementation, but obviously the, uh, the FAA has to mandate that they happen, uh, and the FAA subsequently issued ADs requiring that the operators Im implement any changes that, that Boeing made. So, Let's see what those changes were. Start with the QRH change. This was in uh, December 96. So uh, very quickly, just a couple of months after the, the NTSB issued the recommendation, um, the, the FAA mandated um, changing the ex existing jam flight controls procedure to in include a new section entitled jammed or restricted rudder. So jam flight controls remained, but it had a, the, there was a new procedure called jammed or restricted rudder, which is shown there. Now this new procedure um, was about four and a half pages long in the QRH and uh, and not easy to follow. I mean, I've I've read it, I've I've done it in the sim because I, I you know I, I've been flying the 737 since the early 90s. And I I've, I've watched all this unfold. It was a hideous procedure, absolutely hideous. Um, I'll, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll cover the QRH development in, in more detail at, at the end of this video, but, uh, but needless to say, it, it, this thing, it, it certainly appears from the outside that, that this was rushed out in a couple of months and, and you know, crikey, it doesn't half show it. But, um, but anyway, perhaps of more significance was the introduction of a new QRH re recall procedure entitled Uncommanded Euro Roll. And um, this uh, gave the advice to, to reduce pitch uh, or, or angle of attack and, and increase airspeed, uh, which you can see in the, the highlighted area there. So the, the first thing it says is maintain control of the airplane with all available flight controls. If roll is uncontrollable, immediately reduce pitch or like angle of attack and increase airspeed. Do not attempt to maintain altitude until control is recovered. Now that that really kind of uh, sheds light as, as, as to the, 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 the correct recovery procedure here. And this was new news to everybody. This, this was introduced in the concepts of blowdown and crossover speed. So let's talk about them. Now, it's probably fair to say that before 1997 and the introduction of this new uncommanded Euro roll procedure, very few 737 pilots knew about blowdown and even fewer knew about the crossover speed. Um, I mean, I certainly didn't at the time um, and I'm sure I wasn't alone. 
So to understand the crossover speed, um, we first need to understand blowdown. Now, when you move any control surface in flight, the deflection is actually less for the same input than when you move it when you're stationary on the ground. That difference is due to blowdown. Similarly, full-scale deflection of a control surface in flight is also reduced by blowdown. Rudder blowdown reduces the maximum rudder angle from a pilot commanded full rudder input depending on the existing flight conditions and it represents a balance between the aerodynamic forces acting on the rudder and the mechanical forces produced by the PCU. So you've got your mechanical force from the from the you know the hydraulic mechanical force from the PCU pushing one way, you've got the aerodynamic forces, you know, your your two, three hundred knots or whatever of airflow pushing it back against the, 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 the other way. And where they meet in the middle, that that's um that's the, the, the net rudder deflection that you get. That's but blow down. I say it's not only rudder, it's the same for, for elevators and uh, ailerons and any flight control surface. Now the rudder has got a maximum physical deflection of 29 degrees left or right of centre on the, the NG of the MAX. That's, it's actually slightly less at 26 degrees on the classics. And the, the rudder authority is reduced with airspeed due to blowdown. So that means that a lower constant hydraulic pressure is applied to, to the surface by the actuator. The movement of the panel reduces with increasing airspeed as the dynamic pressure on it increases. And for classics, the, the, the figures for total travel uh, are as follows. So static, so, you know, on the ground, parked up, 26 degrees is, is, is what you get, full, full deflection. At 150 knots, that's reduced to 19 degrees. By 250, you're down to 8 degrees. And at 340 knots, VMO, just 4 degrees of deflection. Now, this is a, a, a recreation of blowdown that, that, that was conducted in the 73700 sim with, with full right rudder pedal applied from 160 through to 340 knots. If you focus on the airspeed and the corresponding rudder deflection, you can see how the rudder deflection reduces with increasing airspeed. Okay, so let's let's see how this ties in with crossover speed. The crossover speed is defined as the speed below which full-scale deflection of ailerons and spoilers can no longer keep the aircraft straight with the rudder with the rudder deflected to its blowdown limit. Now, confusingly, perhaps the crossover speed is not a single speed. But it, it, it actually varies with several factors, including weight, center of gravity, load factor, angle of attack, and um, flat position. And of those, load f factor is, is, is by far the most significant. Um, as an example, for a 737300 at 110,000 pounds and flap 1, which is the, the US 427 situation, the unloaded crossover speed is 187 knots. However, any increase in, in, in G or alpha is, is probably, well, was almost certainly using an attempted recovery maneuver will cause that crossover speed to increase. So we've got a demo of it here. Uh, this video was filmed in a 737-800 sim at 55 tons, 26% MAC. Um, now note that although this is a level 3 simulator, the modelling may not exactly represent real aircraft behaviour at the edges of the envelope. Configuration is flap 1 at 8,000 feet, full right rudder is applied at 180 knots, directional controls maintained with, with partial aileron.
By 160 knots, full aileron is required to maintain directional control. By 150 knots, full aileron can no longer prevent the yaw. And by 140 knots, the yaw is significant, airspeed decaying rapidly, remember the spoilers will be deployed with ailerons creating drag, and directional control is only regained at 170 knots, so much faster than the, the speed at which directional control was lost. Okay, um, next event is the Boeing issue, um, a flight ops review. This um, this was basically issued in, in response to the, uh, the, the uproar as, as to um, the whole crossover speed issue. So the, the, the new uncommanded Euro roll procedure raised a lot of questions amongst operators and crew about the likelihood of 737 rudder malfunctions, the effect of potential rudder malfunctions on flight path control, the meaning of crossover speed, and the question of increased flat manoeuvring speeds to remain above the, the, the crossover speed. So much so that seven months later, in, in July 97, Boeing published Flight Ops Review article entitled 737 Directional Control. Boeing stated that it published the article to address these issues to assure pilots that the 737 is controllable during a, a, a yaw and roll event and provide a recovery technique in case an uncommanded yaw or roll results in an airplane upset. Um, th this flight ops review is, is actually a, a, a really good document. Um, as you can see, it's a seven pager and it's, it's, it's out there on the internet. If you, if you just Google it, you, you'll find it. Um, but really, the, the, the correct place for this is in the Flight Crew Training Manual or, or the FCOMS. Um, we, I mean, eventually, the, you know, most of the information got incorporated, but I, I guess the point is that it should already have been in the Flight Crew Training Manual um, so that the, the, the crew of the accident aircraft would have had a chance to have, to have known about it and, and you know, trained for it in the simulator. Anyway, um, the Flight Ops Review notes that some operators have adopted a 10-knot uh, a increase to block manoeuvring speed for flap up through to flap 10. Boeing's got no technical objection to this technique, um, an increase in manoeuvring speeds of 10 knots above the, um, the Boeing recommended speeds will provide a marginal increase in lateral control authority relative to directional control authority. Um, but they state that because of the variability in crossover speed, we believe using the proper recovery technique of reducing the angle of attack, increasing airspeed, and expeditiously using full control input offers the greatest benefit in overcoming the, the effect of a large bank angle upset, regardless of the course. And I absolutely 100% support Boeing in, in, in this statement. And as, as you probably know, if you were flying the 737s in the in, in the 90s, uh, the, the, there was this big move to, to add 10 knots onto onto various block manoeuvring speeds, and th that is such a <laughs> oh, I don't want to be too strong in what I say, but it, it, it it's it's nothing. It's it, it's it, it really won't help very much. Um, as I hope the, the, the video demo of, of, of crossover speed in, on, on the sim that I showed you earlier shows you, you know, t 10 knots is going to go nowhere. I mean, it'll help, sure, but it's, it, it's not going to make or break the deal. Really, what needs to be done is if you, if, if you find yourself in, 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 in the regime where, where, where ailerons are not overcoming rudder, you've got to increase speed and, and you've, you, you've got to unload. Un unload your G, your, 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 your angle of attack. That, that's that got a greater effect than speed. Um, so, the big question is, was crossover speed hidden? Um, and the, the allegation was made uh, in court. Uh, 
in a, in a case for punitive damages by, by a widow of a US 427 passenger, it was asserted that uh, the Boeing withheld flight test data about the crossover speed. Boeing denied these allegations, stating that the information was made available to the FAA during certification in 1984, and Boeing's position was indeed confirmed during the NTSB investigations. Um, and it's there's a, a, a short extract of of, of that um, that declaration there. Um, so during the, its flight test program on the 737-300 back in '84, Boeing found that at low speeds and flap one and flap five, the the aircraft could not overcome a full rudder deflection by using ailerons. And um, and Boeing said that there is indeed no FAA requirement that says this phenomenon is not acceptable, and they're correct. Um, if it wasn't acceptable, there would be um, there would be an FAR requirement that that it was you know that 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 situation wouldn't be wouldn't be allowed or certifiable. Now. Surprisingly, when Boeing tested the US 427 scenario, they found that the flap one maneuver speed, which is 190 knots, would actually have been slightly above the crossover speed, which is 187 knots for the weight and CFG of that accident aircraft. So, you know, you, it, it was actually just above the crossover speed, uh, assuming it was flying accurately at, at the speed and, and, and when the upset occurred. Um, However, Boeing say that even if the, the 737 is below the crossover speed, the um, the aircraft is still in compliance with, with, with FAR's part uh, 25, 25, 171 and 177 for static lateral and, and directional stability characteristics. And furthermore, they say that this is the case for, for other, possibly all, twin jet airliners. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't have the data on this, um, but I, I actually see no reason to doubt Boeing's position on this, especially as it isn't an, an, an FAR requirement. Um, that, that it's not the case for all 737 twin jets, all Airbus twin jet, all, all airliner twin jets, you know, Embraer, Airbus, the, the, the whole lot, probably have this phenomenon, whereby below a certain speed with a certain flap setting, um, full aileron will not overcome full rudder. Um, as I say, it's 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 not a, an uncertifiable condition. Um, so in June '97, Boeing undertook some additional flight testing in order to further explore the crossover speed. And during these tests, it was discovered that operations with flaps up were were, were actually also impacted by crossover speed. Furthermore, during this flight testing, full rudder hard over simulations were conducted in order to quantify 737 handling characteristics and recovery techniques with, with full rudder deflections. And it was determined that, you know, for the flap 1190 knot case, once a full rudder hard over was experienced, the aircraft had to accelerate to well above the crossover speed before sufficient lateral control was available to recover the aircraft. So you got a kind of you know, almost a hysteresis effect whereby you enter the the crossover uh, region at some point below 190 knots again it it it, it varies on a whole load of factors um you know flap weight cfg um alpha loading you know all all those things but once you're in it you've got to accelerate to to way above the speed you went into crossover to get out of it, and that's the bit that that, that almost certainly w w would have caught out anybody getting into it. You know, such as um, the the Colorado Springs or, or, or Pittsburgh flights. So to summarise, all flight controls are affected by blowdown, um, all of them, um, and it's most dependent on on airspeed. The crossover speed is not a fixed speed for a given configuration. It varies with several other factors, including weight, CFG, load factor, and alpha. Boeing got no technical oper objection to operators increasing certain block speeds, but say that the effect is small because of the previous point. And again, I emphasize they are absolutely right. T 10 knots just, just won't cut it. Um, you know what what once you're down below the uh below the crossover speed you've got to accelerate a long way out of it to get to get out 
Boeing says that the best defense against the roll upset, regardless of the cause, is to use uh, the proper recovery technique of reducing alpha, increasing airspeed, and expeditiously using full control input as per the new QRH procedure for uncommanded Euro roll. And again, they are right. Um, therefore, Boeing did not introduce an in increase to the block speeds because, as they say, it was it, it, it's, it's a small sticking plaster that, that that's really quite ineffective. Now, fair dues to Boeing, they they worked with industry to to produce a uh, a, a generic upset recovery technique, um, as defined by the airplane upset training aid, which was first released in October ninety eight and has been revised. Uh, at least three times to my knowledge and this really formed the basis of upset recovery training um, or, or a proper you know um, structured upset recovery training program in the sim for for airline crew it never really been done before I mean you know you might have got one thrown in you might have inadvertently entered one um, in the in the sim but but this this was a proper training program with, with, with a with a proper um, you know, a generic uh, re recovery technique that, that was valid for, for both conventional, you know, Boeing types and fly-by-wire Airbus types. Um, and that really has, has saved, we we don't know, we, we, we but it, it must be, must be thousands upon thousands of lives uh, bringing in upset recovery training for, for, for pilots. Um, and it all kind of stemmed from these these rudder incidents, so uh, you know a, at least something good did you know did come out of these events. Okay, so let's have a look at the reaction to uh, to the NTSB recommendations and to the um, and to the introduction of, of or, or to the knowledge of, of crossover speed to, to the um, to the aviation community. So. What we have to remember is at this stage, you know, in '96, because of the depth of the investigation and the new scope of combining the, um, the 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 585 and 427 investigations, the NTSB had not yet issued their final report. I mean, it took years. It took, I think, it was three and a half years to to conclude, which you know is is unusually long. M most accident reports are, are done within a year. Um, Although it issued thir the 13 safety recommendations because of unidentified safety issues with the 737 uh, rudder system, it was becoming clear that whilst the triggers for the upsets were, were rotor and weight turbulence encounters, something else, probably rudder related, uh, brought the flights down. Now, unfortunately, facts were, sc were scarce, and this was because of very limited uh, flight data recording da data. and. I will go into this later on in the in the, in the video, um, and there was no hard evidence of a rudder malfunction ever found um, in the in, in in the wreckage of the of the accident aircraft. But circumstantial evidence was 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 building with reports of other fortunately non-fatal rudder events. Um, and Eastwind 517, which survived the rudder hard over, had really brought this into sharp focus. US Airways said that the cause was um, an uncommanded full rudder deflection or rudder reversal that, that placed the aircraft in a flight regime from which recovery was not possible using the known recovery procedures. Again, remember that crossover speed was not known and, and recovery from below the crossover speed, the, well, the recovery method was, was not known. A contributing cause of this accident was the manufacturer's failure to advise operators there was a speed below which the aircraft's lateral control authority was insufficient to counteract a full rudder deflection, and the ALPA view was very similar to US Airways. The NTSB was saying that a rudder reversal scenario would match all three events, uh, without saying that's what it was, and the FAA could simply say that well, no one will ever know the cause with any certainty, so we're focused on making the plane safer. Which, in all honesty, was pretty much all they could do. Now, James Gibbs, uh, flight manager for USA at the time of the crash, and Gordon Kemp, um, a 737 flight manager, said in, in depositions that if the airline had known about certain aerodynamic data concerning the 737, I 
crossover speed, it would have changed its flying procedures before the crash. With the new procedures, I would have expected the uh, the 427 crew to have successfully been able to fly out the situation. And again, we've got absolutely no reason to disagree with him. He's he's right. If if the crew knew about the phenomenon, were trained for it, of course they they would have um, more than likely been able to have, re have recovered from the situation. Boeing's brief reply effectively said that the crew mishandled the situation and knowledge of how the aircraft reacts at certain speeds is less important than a pilot's ability to exercise proper recovery techniques during upsets no matter what the cause. Um, I think that's a bit harsh, um, saying that the crew mishandled the situation when the crew weren't trained how to handle the situation, but um, I suppose technically they uh, they were possibly correct, but as I say, it's, it's extremely harsh. Boeing's view. Um, Charlie Higgins, a, a Boeing VP who was heading up the airplane safety and performance, said in 97 that the rudder control units from the 737s in Pittsburgh and Colorado Springs were both thoroughly examined as part of the NTSB's accident investigations and no jam was detected in either unit. But the test showed that extreme temperature differences between the chilly outside atmosphere and piping hot hydraulic fluid flowing through the backup rudder could cause the mechanism to fail. That would leave the airplane without rudder control if the primary rudder failed. Under even the most severe flying conditions, the temperature differential between the hydraulic fluid and the surrounding co components never exceeds 90 degrees. The rudder failure took place only when the differential was 180 degrees or higher. We can't see a flight where that would occur. So that's his view. Um, and again, Boeing also suggested pilot error in the, 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 the Pittsburgh crash, suggesting pilots may have mishandled the aircraft when reacting to the turbulence, with the FO in, in inadvertently, inadvertently holding the, the left rudder pedal as, as he and the captain pulled back on the yoke during the dive, causing a stall. Boeing also blamed rotors on the um, on the Colorado Springs crash and a misrigged yaw damper for the east wind incident. My full view on this with the benefit of hindsight, I'll give you at the end of the video. More ADs. Uh, these were in the year Jan 97 to Jan 98. Um, and that's where it fits into the timeline. So we're kind of halfway through here. Um, so as a result of the NTSB inter intervention and uh, an, an independent technical advisory panel, the, the, the following ADs were, were, were issued by the FAA. The, uh, the first one was basically relating to, to main rudder PCUs to be, to be removed or tested, and the second one was, it was a, an inspection of the yaw damper engaged solenoid. So again, the, 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 the emphasis here is, is on the, the PCUs, and in particular the yaw damper, because the yaw damper was responsible for some rudder misbehavior on survived accidents or survived incidents. So that's why the focus was, was on, the, uh, on the yaw damper. Galling AD, remember me talking about this earlier on, so it was, um, it was discovered on the input shaft of, uh, of United 585 back in 81, sorry, 91. Um, eventually in 98, a, um, an AD was put out to inspect the, uh, the standby rudder actuator um, for galling within 18 months. Um, the reason being on the standby rudder actuator was because if, 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 if that one failed, then that was the backup system and the galling could produce a binding on it which could stop that from working. Okay then we got on to, to some, um, some design changes. These were the first ones uh, between 97 and 2000 and uh, these hinged around the server valve, rudder pressure reducer and the yaw damper. So, in 1997, Boeing made the first of uh, three design changes to the 737 rudder se system, which uh, the FAA mandated uh, to be made within three years. The first one was to install a newly designed rudder limiting device that reduces the rudder authority at flight conditions where full rudder authority is not required. So that's what we, we know as a rudder pressure reducer. Second one was to install a newly designed yaw damper system that improves the reliability and fault monitoring capability. And this was a new digital yaw damper as opposed to the old analog yaw damper coupler. Um, 
so let's talk about the rudder pressure reducer let me just talk you through the diagram on the right there be before we go into into it so the rudder's shown there on the right you've got the the main pcu at the bottom with and, and the a and the b are the hydraulic system a and b um to it and that the the upper one is the standby hydraulics to the standby rudder pcu you've got the um the rudder pedals feeding in um to the input shaft which is the vertical line and then outputs going out to the uh, to the various PCUs. So the rudder pressure reducer was that uh, box I've shown in red. That was added in. That, that's the only difference between that and the system as it was before. Uh, this was installed to, uh, to to all 737s, originals, classics, and um, the NGs were just coming online because this was 97, and the the, the first NG flew in um, in in early 97. Um, and what this does, it, it, it lowers the hydro hydraulic system A pressure to the main rudder PCU during non-critical phases of flight. And that reduces the rudder authority by approximately a third at higher speeds. Reduced rudder deflection permits more effective aileron control, encountering unwanted rudder inputs, and that'll give more time to recover from a full rudder input, whatever the cause was. So again, you kind of not really stabbing in the door, but the cause is unknown. It, it, it could be many, many things. It could be the could be the yaw damper, it could be the standby rudder PCU, it could be the either PCU, it could be the, the the dual concentric servo valve in there. Um, could be the ore damper, could be any one of a number of things. But in doing this, if you've got less rudder deflection, then you will have enough aileron deflection to be able to recover from a hard over. So that's why this was done. The RPR is controlled and monitored by a new digital yaw damper coupler, uh, which is why it was also mandated by the same AD, because you kind of have to have both. Um, the failure of the RPR to disengage when commanded or a failure resulting in reduced pressure less than 500 psi is indicated by illumination of the flight control A low pressure light. So that got itself a new function um, and hence a, a, a slightly new um, uh, non-normal procedure. On the originals and the classics, the old analog yaw damper coupler, the one on the left there, was replaced by a new shiny digital yaw damper coupler, the one on the right. Um, that the, the function of that automatically controls and monitors the RPR. That's what that does that the other one doesn't. Um, the NGs, of course, don't have uh, that. They, they've got a SMID, a uh, store management yaw damper, and they were upgraded, upgraded for, for that new functionality. The activation criteria for the RPR, uh, you probably know these. Um, the details on the left, just going through the summary. So um, the, basically the bottom line is the pressure is only reduced during non-critical phases of flight. When are they? They're when, you, when you're a, 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 a away from the ground. So uh, the hydraulic A pressure is reduced when you climb above a thousand feet and it's restored when you descend below 700 feet. It will also restore if either hydraulic system depressurizes, so you've got the other hydraulic system to, uh, to power the main PCU. If you have an M1 split of more than 45%, in other words, your engine out, so you're going to need full rudder um, to help you there, or uh, a loss of um, all electrical power, and that is because the um, if you remember the rudder pressure re re uh, reducer is controlled by the yaw damper. The yaw damper is electronic, so if there's no electrics, then the the RPR can't be controlled, so it fails safe and restores the um, restores the hydraulic pressure. The next AD was uh, 97.14.04 and this required the installation of a new vernier control rod bolt and a new main rudder PCU servo valve within two years. The, the new servo valve is similar to the, the one used on the NG and it's designed to eliminate the possibility of a rudder reversal. So again, remember that this was uh, started develop, being developed in 91. Um, it, if, 
it, it came online seven years later. I mean, it, it took an indeterminably long time. Um, but again, the, the just a, to, a, a reminder, the slides were lengthened and the end cap was, was modified so you couldn't get an over-travel of the slides, which could cause a... Um, a reversal of, of, of the of, of the hydraulic flow and those flow paths are being widened out separated so that again you can't have hydraulic flowing in the uh, the, the wrong direction so in uh, in July 97 uh, Boeing did another airline and magazine article uh, this was a, a massive 10 page article I mean the the, the magazines only about 30 or 40 pages so it, was, it really was the, it was the bulk of it um, and this was really a um, a PR offensive uh, entitled making a safe airplane safer uh, they were describing the design and the QRH procedure changes and and you know I'm saying it was a PR uh, offensive it yes it was but but they they did actually make a huge effort here a 10 page effort to uh, to describe the, the the new system in in a huge amount of detail um so i'm probably doing them a, a disservice in that but the, i'll say the title making a safe airplane safer i it, it just kind of just grates a little bit but the the the, the summary for it um is, is as given on the right. So there were two 737 accidents occurred earlier this decade for which the industry has re reached no consensus on probable cause. Uh, though no evidence has been found of a rudder control system technical mal malfunction in these accidents or any 737 accident, speculation persists that this system may have been involved. While Boeing does not believe that a system failure was involved with either accident, the company has determined that the design enhancements described in this article make the rudder control system design more robust. Which which is true. It 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 certainly does make the system more robust. But uh, but really they had to do something. They were they were starting to lose aircraft um, uh, all too often. Um, talking of which, two more incidents. Uh, these were in 1999. So this this was um, a couple of years after the um, the the rudder pressure reducer and yaw damper uh, AD had been issued. Uh, say Feb 99. Uh, the pilots of a United 737-300 reported sluggish rudder control while uh, while taxiing out at uh, Seattle. The NTSB said the apparent problem was a misposition valve spring guide in the rudder's main PCU. And in Feb 99, a Metrojet 737 200 made a precautionary landing in Baltimore after the aircraft rolled slightly and changed direction during cruise flight. The rudder moved involuntarily at two rates, first slowly and then more rapidly, all the way over to a hard over. The pilots could do nothing to make the rudder move, including the initial QRH procedure of turning off the autopilot and the yaw damper. The pilots reported that when they turned off the hydraulic pressure, the rudder snapped back into position but continued to chatter and vibrate throughout the landing. No known scenario could cause such an event. The NTSB explained that the, examined the, the PCU but didn't find evidence of a cause. All that investigators were able to conclude is that a rudder deflection did occur according to the, the, the FDR. Now those two rudder in incidents caused huge concern because they occurred on aircraft retrofitted with the, the redesigned main PCU server valve in accordance with the AD from, uh, from the end of 97. That should have made a valve jam impossible. After the incidents, the, the dual server valves on both aircraft were inspected for, for cracks or defects, but none were found. And this added to a growing weight of opinion that a full rudder PCU design was needed, rather than just a new servo valve. In March 99, the US 427 uh, report was, was finally issued. Um, a reminder that the incident w occurred in September 94, so uh, th this was over four years, four and a half years uh, after the accident. 
the NTSB, and I say it wasn't that the, the NTSB were being slow, that they were being thorough, and, and of course they, they were they were doing a combined investigation into that, the, the Colorado Springs and the, the, the East Wind uh, event as well. So they, they issued the report uh, in what's known as a sunshine meeting, I won the token to public observation, and the scope of the report was, was widened out to safety issues uh, in the report focused on the 737 rudder malfunctions, including rudder reversals, the adequacy of the 737 rudder system design, unusual attitude training for air carrier pilots, and flight data recorder parameters. This report considered not only US 427 but also United 585, Eastwind 517 and all other known your role events on the 737 and this is why it took four and a half years to produce. As a result of this investigation all three events were given the same probable cause. A rudder reversal caused by a jam in the main rudder PCU dual concentric servo valve. Dennis Critter, who's uh, Chief Technical Advisor, Vehicle Simulation with the NTSB, who spent months de developing commuter sim simulations of the three flights um, that, from the limited data from the FDRs. He concluded that a rudder reversal scenario would match all three events. The NTSB said that the specific problem of a jammed servo valve that likely caused the rudder to malfunction had been solved by the a redesign of the valve, now being retrofitted onto more than 3,737s. But the board said that the valve redesign was not sufficient to remove the possibility that such a malfunction couldn't happen again in a different fashion. Um, and a, a couple of extracts I've, I've put down there. Um, the rudder design changes to the 737, this point twenty-three, uh, currently being retrofitted, do not eliminate the possibility of other potential failure modes and malfunctions in the in the rudder system that could lead to loss of control. And point number twenty-four, the dual concentric servo valve, um, is not reliably redundant, and that's even with the redesigns. The NTSB unanimously said that the FAA should require that all 737s have a reliably redundant rudder actua actuation system. Sources said that the board staff had wanted to be more specific, but board members were uncomfortable with making a specific recommendation in the absence of hard evidence. Even though investigators showed uh, investigators recovered the rudder valve in all three cases, when they examined it, it showed no obvious signs of a jam. The NTSB also called on the FAA to convene a test and evaluation board to isolate a fault that, that might appear and disappear quickly, leaving no trace. And the FAA said that they, they'd done that, and that, that was the ETEB. So, really, the, the, the thing remained a mystery, um, unfortunately. Boeing's uh, view of it, that, that their submission to the report said that the wake encounter is recognised as the event initiator, but not the cause of the rudder going to its full deflection. Two remaining potential ex explanations can theoretically account for a sustained left rudder input. First is that an airplane re related failure caused the input, or the second is that the crew commanded the rudder input during the attempted recovery from the wake encounter and then held it in during the events that followed. Now, obviously, we will never know which it was, but Boeing said, read the failure, there is no evidence that any postulated rudder failure occurred to, to cause the uncommanded full rudder deflection. Uh, and I think the key word there is, there is no evidence, because no evidence was ever found um, in, in, in the investigations. However, they say, it is possible that the FO countered the right roll acceleration by making a left rudder input coupled with a real reversal from right to left. A left rudder deflection was sustained for the remainder of the flight. Scientific literature suggests that the FO could have remained focused on the control wheel as the life-threatening event developed whilst being unaware of his pedal input. This scenario is consistent with the comments on the CVR. So again, that's that's Boeing's take on it. I mean, you know, it's clear that's the one that they think is, is the most likely. In other words, flight crew error. 
in the absence of hard evidence against the rudder, there was always going to be another theory for each crash. And for United 55, it was rotor. For 427, it was, it was mishandled weight turbulence. But the NTSB were unconvinced of these other theories. Um, Dennis Critter, who uh, mentioned before, the chief tech advisor of the NTSB, said to produce the movements seen in United 585, the rotor would have to have been 36 times as strong as the strongest recorded rotor and then somehow follow the, the, the plane all the way to the ground. Malcolm Brenner, human performance specialist with the NTSB, said that the pilot theory for 427 was just not plausible. Even after reaching their conclusions, board members acknowledged they were uncomfortable that they had no specific evidence, only strong circumstantial evidence and simulations partly based on assumptions of the aircraft movements. March 99, Charlie Higgins, again from Boeing, uh, released the, the following statement and he said that working cooperatively with the NTSB, Boeing has invested more than 75,000 engineering hours on this effort, which, you know, is is undoubtedly true. So, so you know, Boeing weren't just sitting back, you know, le letting this thing wash over, simply saying that you've got no evidence. They were actually actively looking to find the cause. Because of course they knew if they didn't find you know the the real cause, there was every chance this could happen again. So you know, but Boeing did have some skin in the game here, and they they were, as you can see, seventy five thousand engineering hours, trying to find out what 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 happened. Um, they gave quite a comprehensive, or, or Charlie Higgins gave quite a comprehensive list of, of, of what Boeing had done to help prevent future accidents and, and you know these are all absolutely great things. So they said they made design improvements to include, a, to preclude a reversal in the 737 rudder system, uh, which of course they had as, as discussed earlier. They, they changed the yaw damper system to improve its reliability, they've added a rudder pressure reducer to, to limit the authority. Uh, to help crew better manage upsets regardless of the cause. They've added maintenance checks to ensure the rudder system is operating normally. They've added in-flight procedures, either the QRH procedures, to help crews respond in the, uh, the extremely unlikely event, they say, of a rudder malfunction. The FAA has mandated all the above changes by overworthiness directives, and in addition, Boeing's worked with the rest of industry to develop training to prepare pilots for in-flight upsets, again, regardless of the cause. So. You know, Boeing are not the bad guys here. They they have done a lot. Um, in uh, they put a lot of time and effort into um, either solving the problem or or, or mitigating the, the the effects of it occurring. In October 1999, in a highly unusual move, the reports of all three accidents and interviews uh, accidents and incidents were later revised in light of the uh, the rudder issues that came to light and a common conclusion was as follows which is that the, the most likely cause was movement of the rudder surfaces to their blow down limit in a direction opposite to that commanded by the pilot. Those surfaces most likely moved as a result of jams of the secondary slide to the servo valve housings offset from the neutral position and over travel of the primary slide. So in other words, it was the dual servo valve, the dual concentric servo valve, what did it? Block speeds increased May 1999 and there it is on the timeline very very soon after the, um, after the final report was issued, just a, a couple of months after. Um, so as a result of that uh, US 427 investigation, the FAA issued FSAT 9912, um, which is reproduced there on the right for you to, to read. The bottom line is it recommends a 10 knot maneuvering airspeed increase for flap settings of up 1, 5 and 10 at various gross weights for the 737, 1234 and 500 series and uh, extracts. I've uh, or relevant extracts I've 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 highlighted there, if you want to read it. Again, th th these things are, are are out there on the internet. If you uh, you know if you just Google FSAT 9912, you can you can read the whole thing to to your uh, to your delight. But uh, but that that's the gist of it. Um, the the FAA kind of unilaterally overrode uh, Boeing's advice that the um, that the block speed 
were, was not really the issue. It was the recovery technique um, and, and mandated an increase in block speeds. So Boeing, uh, having been mandated to do it, did it with an ops manual bulletin. Um, and this uh, increased the block speeds for flaps 1 to 10. Um, and low, the FSAT recommended block speed increases for flaps up 1, 5, and 10. The bulletin notes that flux, flap, um, sorry, block speed changes are only required for the, the classics, not the originals, at flaps 5 and uh, 10. The originals and NGs didn't need a block speed to remain above the crossover speed, so th this really only affected the classics. And as a result, we got a new flap speed schedule. Um, note that the the 10 knot speed increase was only for the approach. Increasing block speeds for takeoff wasn't considered necessary due to the relatively short time at, at, at speeds below the crossover speed. I mean, you know, we're talking seconds, whereas, of course, on an approach, you can be at these speeds for, for minutes. On the originals and classics before 99, it, um, <laughs> just to, to educate those of you who, who, who weren't flying the, uh, the aircraft back then, but um, but I was, and it was SOP to decelerate from clean to, uh, to, to VREF plus 5 via every single flap position, all seven stages. Um, we, 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 we used to call them all out, so it was flap 1, 190, flap 2, 180, flap 5, 170, 10, 160, 15, 150, 25, 140, and then 30 VREF plus 5. Um, as a result of the, um, the, 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 the speed increases, um, flap 2 non, no longer had any practical application and, and it just fell out of use. So we, technically we were down to six stages, but fortunately for commonality with the NG, um, <laughs> we, we, we removed a, a few stages. Now we only decelerate using flaps 1, 5, and 15 before the landing flap. So uh, it's, it's, it's a whole lot easier to, uh, to do these days. Um, now let's talk about the ETB who uh, who who were in, convened from May ninety nine to July two thousand, and uh, and that's where they were. So it was it was it, it was pretty much after uh, the block speeds were increased, um, and again very soon after the, um, the 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 final report was issued for the um, for 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 the uh, the Pittsburgh accident. So the ETB, the Engineering Test and Evaluation Board, uh, arose for, from one of the recommendations by the NTSB um, to conduct a failure analysis of the rudder control, um, the rudder actuation control system of the 737. So they formed in May 99 by the FAA, so it was the FAA that convened this, issued its final report um, just over a year later in, in what's been called the most in-depth scientific study ever of any commercial airplane system. And that was the brief there. Um, that, that's actually a reproduction of the NTSB recommendation for what they wanted the, um, the, the, the board to look at. And so you can, you can read that in your own time. Just, just hit pause and read it if you wish to. In assembling the ETB, the, the FAA used two criteria technical expertise and no connection with or knowledge of the 737 rudder system. So in other words, they, they, they wanted the, the, the best minds, but people who didn't have any pre-existing um, knowledge, ideas, notions, conceptions of the 737 rudder. So the team was headed by um, this chap on the right, John McGraw, um, manager of the FAA's Airplane and Flight Crew Interface Branch at Seattle, and he himself's a former military helicopter test pilot, so um, very capable man. Um, the board was composed of scientists from the, uh, the FAA, NASA, the Defense Department, ALPA were even represented, the, the Air Transport Association, the Russian Air Transport Accident Investigation Committee, which is a sign of the times, couldn't see that happening these days, uh, Ford Motor Company and Boeing. Um, now the Boeing personnel came from Boeing Military in Long Beach, not Seattle, uh, where the 737s made, because obviously Seattle engineers could be too familiar with the rudder. Now, as if that wasn't a, a disparate group of um, brains, an independent challenge team of outside experts were, was, was also formed to review the scope, process, direction, findings, and recommendations. And um, 
and and that challenge team in, included the, the US Air Force Deputy Chief of Safety, Chairman of the Russian Accident Investigation Committee, and the NTSB Chief of Major Investigations Division of the NTSB. So really, it, it, it was a um, a formidable um, team on 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 this board, and, and an equally formidable challenge team as well. So the um, the board had full access to everything it wanted, um, including lab space at Boeing. Engineers used a vibration table to shake rudder co components, a coal box that could produce realistic flight temperatures, a device that could produce sudden spikes in hydraulic fluid temperatures from 65 degrees below zero to 210 degrees above zero. Um, and they could also spray water into the, the rudder mechanism um, to, to produce ice. They even constructed the, um, a first-of-a-kind test device called a fin rig, which you can see in the, uh, the photo there. This is a full 737 uh, vertical tail fin and rudder con connected to a sophisticated aircraft engineering simulator. Um, so any rudder control commands uh, by a pilot were mimicked in real time on the, on the rudder. Uh, which was placed where the pilot could easily see its movements. The uh, the board brought in ten flight crews from four airlines on the 737 to 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 fly this sim c connected to the, uh, the the fin rig. They used the existing recovery procedures to deal with about 40 different rudder failure modes. So uh, really, it was an incredibly thorough process. Not only that. The uh, the ETB leased a 737-200 from Purdue University for for ground and flight tests, and this aircraft was fitted with a comprehensive set of sensors to the, to trace every movement of the uh, the flight controls, uh, in particular, of course, the uh, the rudder system, and um, that that they they said we we will know exactly where the wheel is, what position it's in, what force is being used, what the rudder pedal forces are the strain on the cables, the exact condition of the primary and secondary valves on the PCU. We will know everything that is going on and we will be able to measure that rudder response against known upsets. Um, they actually conducted 25 hours of flights, uh, including flights close to the Cascade Mountains to, to, to pick up rotor and also flights in the wake of a 727. So really they, they were doing everything possible to try and recreate the uh, the the events and the the incidents, DTB issued its final report in July 2000. Uh, the full report wasn't actually made public as it contained proprietary information, but the findings and the recommendations were published. And again, you know, al along with all the, the stuff I presented, it's all it's all out in the public domain. You can you can Google any of this if you if you wish to find it. It contained nine key findings, ten key recommendations. These were divided into long and short term actions, with three of the actions being identified for accomplishment as soon as possible after issuance of the report. And the key findings, uh, well, amongst the key findings, uh, were, the, were the following. So these are, these are the ones I've picked out. Um, the 737 rudder control system is susceptible to a number of failures and jams that can cause uncommanded rudder motion. Even with the current ADs incorporated, all models of the 73 rudder, even the NG, has got numerous failure modes that could be catastrophic in the takeoff and landing regimes. And at a typical cruise speed and altitude, there are no catastrophic failure modes. The addition of an RPR does not eliminate catastrophic effects of failures and jams during takeoff and landings, but it does reduce the exposure time. In general, the flight crews found the existing four and a half page jammed and restricted uh, rudder QRH procedure difficult to use. I mean, gosh, you're telling me it, it was a hideous procedure. But anyway, um, ice formation can interfere with the PCU and cause amplified oscillations of the rudder in response to your damper commands. This will also result in corresponding movement to the rudder pedals. A your damper hard over under such a condition will cause an uncommanded rudder deflection to the blowdown limit. So some pretty chunky findings and, um, and equally chunky recommendations. The board recommended in the draft that Boeing modify the 737 rudder control system so that no single failure, single jam or any latent failure in combination 
in combination with any other single jam or failure will cause catastrophic effects. So the, the, you've gone beyond the single failure mode here because of that phrase in combination with to include multiple failures. And that's that's the key because if you remember the, the dual concentric servo valve was designed to be um, re redundant for, for, for a single failure, it would still work. And a multiple failure did not have to be considered because it doesn't in aircraft certification. Here, they're actually saying, not good enough for the rudder system, we need multiple failure protection. The rudder also recommends simplifying and giving additional training to the jammed or restricted rudder QRH procedure, displaying rudder position, which hasn't been uh, universally done, but th those airlines which choose to have the optional control surface position indicator, and again this is only available on the NG and the MAX, do have this facility. And alerting crew and engineers to signs of rudder malfunctions, for instance small rudder kicks that pilots might think were, were minor yaw damper problems, obviously that was done with education. It also recommends new maintenance inspection procedures, which were done, and a new hydraulic design to allow hydraulic pressure to be cut off to the rudder without affecting other control surfaces. That actually wasn't done. There's no way of, of, uh, of, of doing that even now. So, enter the Rudder System Enhancement Program, the RSEP, from 2000 to 2003. So there we go, right at the end of the timeline. Um, and and this was a this was a three year project for for development and uh, production. So as a result of the ETB report, Boeing launched a complete redesign of the rudder control system. The new system was known as the the Rudder System Enhancement Program, which is widely known as the RSEP. And uh, two years later, in November 2002, the, uh, the FAA issued uh, an AD which mandated the installation of the, uh, that new system within six years of the, uh, of the issuance of the AD. Taking the timeline up to 2008, which is way beyond what I've, I, I've drawn it. The only reason this started in 2002, that, that this AD, was because that, that was when it was, it was ready. Remember, the... the the, the 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 new system redesign was only launched uh, in in 2000. It, it wasn't actually ready for a couple of years. So items in the RSEP: the uh, the rudder PCU valve redesign. Well, obviously, uh, new rudder PCU input fasteners, new hydraulic pressure limiter, yaw damper system redesign, rudder input force transducer revised QRH procedures, improved crew training, enhanced flight data recorders, and revised maintenance procedures. Um, so they're, they're the, the, the headline items. Um, so let's, let's go through those. The new PCU, I say this is a whole new unit. Um, it wasn't just tweaks, it was a whole new unit. It was redesigned by, uh, by Boeing and the manufacturer Parker Hannafin. That's the new one sat there identifiable by having two input levers at the bottom instead of just one. But I'll come on to that in a moment. And at the heart of it was a new servo valve. So the old dual concentric servo valve, which you can see inset there in the top right corner of, the, of this slide, um, that was binned. Um, and it was replaced by two separate control valves, one for hydraulic system A and one for hydraulic system B. That removed any possibility of a jam hard over reversal by the concentric valve sliders binding on each other or the housing or over traveling or whatever all of the other issues have been. They, they just did away with it and, and separated the valves out. Thank goodness for that. Um, and, and that was at the heart of the um, of, the, of the PCU. The the new separate control valves, which you saw on the previous slide, they now receive their inputs from separate input linkages. So the old PCU just had a single input linkage, which you can see there. Um, the new one has got two, uh, one going to each each valve, each each control valve. Those um, input linkages are shown here. Uh, so the, the, this photo was just taken uh, about a month or so ago on, on a 
I forget whether that was an NG or a Max, um, but either way, it's it, it's all the same. And you can see that the the the, the sort of silver grey components there are the uh, are the input linkages. You can just see where, where it connects onto the the PCU, which is obviously not not very visible here um, from the uh, from the input rods. Uh, the upper one's hydraulic A and the, the low one's hydraulic B for what it's worth. Okay, so the input rods that you saw on, on the previous photo there. Previously, it had just been one single input rod to the, to the, to the old PCU. And, and that single input rod gave inputs uh, or gave its input to the dual concentric servo valve. As the dual concentric servo valve is separated out into two separate valves, you've got two separate linkages and two separate input rods coming from the input torque tube. There. They are your uh, your new two separate input rods shown in the, in, in this photo. Um, the upper rod is is the one going to the standby rudder PCU, and the uh, and the bottom pair of the ones go to the the main PCU. And you and you can just see the PCUs be, behind the uh, the input rods in the in the photo. All three input rods now have individual jam override devices. These are mounted on the input torque tube. And what these do, these allow rudder pedal inputs to be transferred to the remaining free rods if a jam occurs in, 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 in one of the rods or, 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 or linkage or valve. So th this was previously a function performed within the dual concentric servo valve. And again, th th this was why there was a dual concentric servo valve in the first place, because it was designed um, to, to be resistant you know, uh, to, to, to jams. Because if there was a jam on, on one sleeve, the other sleeve would still work. That, I, I mean, ironically, that, that that was its downfall. But but um, but here we go. So new override devices, and uh, that's what they look like on the on the real aircraft. So the the spring loaded roller and cam um, devices on the on the input torque tube, and they've got a breakout load of eighteen pounds at the rudder pedal. So if you've got a jam on one input rod, um, it won't. Uh, it won't sub it, it won't jam the the input torque tube well it will initially but you can overpower it with 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 just 18 pounds of of, of rudder pedal force which will go back up the aircraft you know through the um through the transmission rods and cables it will move this input torque tube and in doing so it, it will move the 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 non-jammed input rod transmitting to the, um, the, the the remaining servo valve on the PCU. Now if you recall the the original uh, pre-RSEP uh, schematic looked like this so the the digital yaw damper and RPR were, were added to the the rudder system on on the originals and classics uh, not NGs because they hadn't been invented yet um, just a reminder that the RPR lowers hydraulic system A pressure to the main rudder PCU during non-critical phases of flight, um, thereby reducing rudder authority by around about a, a third. Um, and that that's that kicks in uh, above a thousand feet on climb out and below 700 feet on descent. The RSEP program changed this um, this system further, and this is the RSEP version of the um, of the schematic. So the RPR uh, is, is, is now augmented by a rudder pressure limiter, an RPL, on the B system. The RPR and RPL are both controlled by the digital yaw damper computer. I should say that the RPL has really got exactly the same function as the RPR. Other than it's on the B system, and the A, the the RPR is on the the A system. I think the only reason they called it an RPL and not an RPR was just to differentiate it from from the other one. I I don't know, but 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 certainly the, the, there's absolutely no difference between the two. And I'll I, I think I'll mention that in a moment. Um, the NG with RSP 
differs slightly from the originals by having two RPLs, not an RPR and an RPL. Again, it's just nomenclature. They're the same thing. They, they do exactly the same. Um, the only real difference is on the NG and the Max, as opposed to the originals and the classics, they are um, airspeed activated rather than altitude activated. So on the originals and the classics, they kicked in climbing through a thousand feet, descending through 700 feet. On the NGs and the Max, it's at about 137 knots. Actually, it depends slightly on the series, but, but 137 knots is, is, is round about where it is. They're also controlled by the flap slat electronic unit, the FSCU, not the yaw damper uh, computer. Their function is the same across all series. Again, they only differ in name. To summarize that lot, putting it all on one table, and, and just to show you how frustrating the nomenclature is, the RPR and or the RPL, they're both shown in your FCOM diagrams as control valves. So you, you won't these days see any references to, to RPRs and RPLs. On the diagrams, they're labeled in your, in, in your FCOMs as control valves. For the engineers watching this in the maintenance manual, they're called authority limiters. Again, they're the same thing. The associated circuit breakers are called rudder load limiters on the classics and rudder authority limiters on the NG and the MAX. So you, we, there are at least four different names for these things, and they all do the same. And that table uh, kind of summarizes um, what they do in the hydraulic pressures, both pre and post RSEP. Another thing RSEP added was a force fight monitor. Um, th this is on the main rudder PCU, and this detects opposing pressure or force fight um, between the A and B actuators. And this will happen if uh, if either there's a hydraulic system input rod or control valve as as jammed or failed. Um, then you get this force. I, say it's a, I always find this a strange term, strange you know, use of words, force fight monitor. Um, but anyway, it's, it's opposing pressure or, you know, a, a force fight. Um, the force fight monitor is, is monitored by the new Yordamp computer or, or the SMID on the, um, on the NGs. If a force fight is detected for more than five seconds, the, um, the Yordamp computer SMID will automatically turn on the standby hydraulic pump pressurizing the standby rudder PCU. And a standby rudder on light was added to the, the flight controls panel to, to show that action. The primary way the crew can identify if an aircraft has an RSEP is by the addition of a standby rudder on light in the standby hydraulic column of the flight controls panel. So there it is. And you know really, they should be the only ones that, that, that you see now. When illuminated, it indicates that the standby rudder PCU is pressurized, and that might be pressurized either automatically due to force flight monitor activation, loss of system A or B, or manually through the flight control switches. Quick word about the circuit breakers. Uh, as a more subtle way to identify if RCP is installed, um, you can check the circuit breakers. The originals and classics have got a rudder load limiter and a force flight monitor circuit breaker each. The NG and the Max have got a rudder authority limiter and a force fight monitor circuit breaker. Again, no idea why they changed the nomenclature, but uh, but there you go. At least force fight monitor is common between the, the generations. So just to summarize the differences between the um the NG Max and the and the earlier series, the the RPLs are airspeed, not altitude activated. The FSCU, not the yaw damper, monitors the, the RPLs and the standby PCU has got a standby yaw damper which is monitored by the SMED. So there you go, that's that's the differences between the, the NG and the classics. Development and production uh, took, i say, about three years and it took until January 2003 for the first 737s to be delivered with RSEP. Some, uh, what's that, 12 years after the, is, 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 is my maths right there, 91 to 2000, I don't know, it's too late in the evening. A long time, a long time after the, uh, the first accident. But they got there in the end. 
post RSCP issues. Well, pleased to report that no RSCP aircraft have had a rudder hard over reversal or uncommanded rudder. That, by anyone's measure, is an absolute success um, because it's been, you know, 20 years since th since this was introduced, and um, that there hasn't been a, an event since. The only issue of significance um, was that in late. 2005 and early 2006, two aircraft were found with fractures in their uh, their PCU input rods. The rod ends were loose, but were, were actually retained by sealant. Um, the fractures were found during maintenance and, and actually hadn't been noticed by crew, um, which you know is, is is testimony to the design. Um, the cause for that was a manufacturing defect that. Um, uh, escape magnetic particle inspection. Um, the FAA put out an AD to replace all the rods in service within in two years for the main PCUs, 90 days for the standby ones, and been no further issues since. So that was discovered and knocked on the head. Okay, I mentioned I'd talk about the um, the, the evolution of the QRH procedures. They're, they're quite an interesting sideline. This um, obviously we've touched on some of it already, but but let me take you through the uh, the procedures. So um, that top graphic there that that's that's from the original 737 um, QRH uh, 1967. Um, and all there was then was abnormal flight controls, jam sticky or faulty system over power. That that was it. That was all you got. Um, so the, there was no QRH procedure that covered any rudder problems, probably because there hadn't been any rudder problems. Uh, so that you know the, there wasn't any need felt, let alone rudder hard over or reversal. Um, I'll say the closest was that original one-line procedure. In '89, um, b before the, the the first action, that that was changed to jammed or restricted flight controls, um, which basically just told you to um, disengage everything and verify thrust is is, is symmetrical. But uh, in December '96, following the NTSB recommendations, the um, these two new procedures were were, were rushed out. Um, so the first one is the the uncommanded yaw or roll, and that instructed you to to reduce uh, angle of attack and and increase speed to to reduce the crossover speed and accelerate above it. And the and the second one was the the jammed or restricted flight controls, um, to, which which broke out into jammed or restricted rudder. And that was the one that was, I say, four and a half pages long in the QRH and, and really wasn't easy to follow. Four years later, the ETB determined that that hideous jammed or restricted rudder procedure was, was inadequate and, and must be re revised for, well, th those reasons given there. Um, and it was changed to um, the uncommanded rudder procedure which was far shorter at one and a half pages. Um, the original uncommanded your roll one re remained unchanged. Um, I I have a theory that they changed the names of the procedures um, just to differentiate between them, but I'm but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, th that that was a good thing. The the QRH procedure got um, got three pages chopped off it, and and it it did become a much easier procedure to follow. From 2003, aircraft started to be delivered with the RCP and the new standby rudder on light, so of course that needed a new QRH procedure. Um, it could be indicative of a force fight at the, the main PCU, so crew in, are instructed to avoid large or abrupt rudder pedal inputs. The procedure changed very slightly with the, the 2008 QRH reformat, which I'll, I'll come on to later, to separate moving the flight control switches and a hydraulic non-normal into two separate conditions, because previously they'd been bundled together. And in 2003, um, the QRH procedures were, were further advised to take advantage of, of RSEP. So the, the uncommanded rudder and uncommanded yaw roll, they merged to become uncommanded rudder stroke your or roll and this made reference to the new standby rudder on light in the flight controls panel and the procedure was after first taking out the automatics if you had a standby rudder on light installed 
to accomplish the, the jammed or restricted flight controls checklist. If you didn't have that light, then you did the old uncommanded rudder procedure. So it kind of sent you around in, in a circle, depending on what modification state your aircraft was. In 2004, that procedure was, was modified further by adding a, a, a stage that called for flaps to be retracted to flap 1 if they were extended. And the cause of that was nothing to do with the rudder. It was um, it, it was in case the roll was due to an outboard flap carriage spindle fracture. And this was a known issue at the time and there was a, there was an FCOM bulletin out to, to, to crew about it. Um, so it was to do that before actioning the standby rudder light uh, options because it might it might fix it that might have been the original problem then the uncommanded rudder stroke your or roll procedure that that this was written for a for a mixed fleet of 737 some with and some without the RSEP basically this directed you to to jam the restrictive flight controls if you had a standby rudder on light illuminated um, similarly the jammed or flight restrictive flight controls would, would direct you back if you didn't have a standby rudder on light. So again, the, the, these were two procedures that, that were dependent or not on you having RSEP f fitted. Once the, your fleet was completely retrofitted with RSEP, then you could bin this procedure and you could just go to the, to the one jammed or restrictive flight controls pr procedure. So th this was the one, and uh, as I say, that was 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 revised uh, when you were all RSCP to take out, you know, batting you back to the uncommanded procedure, and that r effectively made that a, a a truly generic flight controls procedure again. So if if you notice that the, there's no reference in there to to rudder at all. Now the only other change was the was the big one done in two thousand and eight. Uh, which again, those who were flying the the 737 at that time will, will, will remember that the the, the QRH changed hugely for, for for the better, and this all came about because of that ETB report um, back in 2000. Now the ETB found that the the jammed or restricted rudder procedures that the, this you know four and a half pager formulated by Boeing and sometimes further modified by airlines were confusing and time consuming for crew and again th trust me they were other comments and the, the, these are the ETB's comments not mine but other comments from the ETB were lack of understanding about NNC logic i.e. the crew had lack of understanding crews found them confusing found difficulty at decision points and were very often unable to complete them on the first attempt now that really isn't what you want out of a QRH procedure so um, so Boeing went away, uh, scratched the heads, and um, and reformatted the the entire QRH. So this is not just the the procedures relating to to rudder or flight controls. They reformed that the whole lot. Um, and one of the big things they did was they 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 added numbered steps. Which made following procedures much much easier for for crew. So the the you 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 would go through a, a sort of a decision tree, and at the end of it, like step seven there on on this example, choose one. Are the controls are normal? Then you got your four dots. I end the procedure. Or controls are not normal. Go to step eight, um, which obviously is the next step in that particular case. I mean that's not a particularly good example. I mean, it's, but some which are more complex. Those go-to step statements are brilliant in in the heat of the moment in the, in in the sim or God forbid in you know in the in in the real world. So that that was a that was a big improvement made um, as a result of these um, these seven three seven rudder accidents. FDR development. Okay, so flight data recorder. I did say I mentioned this. It's just for completeness with the story because I, I think it puts some flesh on the bones as, as to why the, the, this whole process took well over a decade. So the NTSB repeatedly pointed out that flight data recording uh, data from, from, the, from the accident aircraft was very limited. Now, the, the first one, United 585, the Colorado Springs one, had an original five parameter FDR 
<laughs> let me just say that again a five parameter FDR now th those of us used to um, flight data monitoring you know having many many hundreds of parameters if not thousands will will we'll find this staggering well they didn't and if you see on the table on the right pre-1989 regs you only had to have five parameters and those parameters were altitude airspeed heading vertical acceleration and whether you were keying the microphone or not that was it and that was all the investigators had to go on that well obviously that and the cvr um so really they were they were working in the dark trying to work out what happened with a a a a, 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 a rudder event well i mean at the time they didn't know it was a rudder event you know what could have possibly caused this aircraft to topple having only got altitude speed heading g and microphone keying information with, with, with the cvr it, you know it, i i think those guys are, are amazingly good for, for having worked out eventually you know what happened to these aircraft now us 427 was slightly better um that had a 13 parameter fdr um now it only actually had to have an 11 parameter fdr it had two more um but but if you again if you look at the list of parameters there altitude airspeed heading uh g longitudinal acceleration microphone keying pitch attitude roll attitude engine parameters and control column position so really it it, it it's only control column position control column position and and you know pitch and roll which are the add-ons there uh, and notice it doesn't have rudder position either rudder pedal position just control column position so um so neither FDR could could record data regarding the flight control surface positions or rudder pedal input. Now the the NTSB investigated 28 737 incidents involving anomalous rudder activity or uncommanded rolls between 91 and 95, and because all 28 aircraft involved were manufactured before May 89, under FARs they were only required to record five parameters of flight data, and as a result. The the NTSB, in their words, lacked certain definitive investigative criteria and had little more than flight crew subjective re recollections to aid in determining a probable cause. Again, they were working in the dark. So, back in 95, the NTSB issued safety recommendations uh, A9525 through to 27, which required the upgrading of FDRs on transport category aircraft. And the uh, A9525 specifically was about the, the 737. Uh, the others were about all transport category aircraft. It was eventually implemented in, in late 97, and, they, and the, the rule required that by August 2001, and you can, you can see how the clock's being pushed back all the time here, all airliners built before October 91 to be fitted with an 18 parameter DFDR. And again, 18 parameters isn't that much better. Um, but it, it was to include the addition of uh, both flight control surface positions and flight control inputs for all three axes, lateral acceleration and autopilot engagement. That figure rose to 22 uh, by August 2002. Um, and for info, aircraft built after October 91 require 34 parameter groups rising to 88 by August 2002. But that was only aircraft built after October 91. So any aircraft built before then, you know, you, you were back down at the, um, at, the, at the 22 parameter group region. So the NTSB were, were a, a bit, you know, frustrated with the slow progress of these recommendations. And um, when presenting the, the, uh, the, the US 427 report, Jim Hall, who's the, the, the then chairman, said that the FAA and Boeing could have shortened rudder investigations if the incident aircraft had been equipped with more sophisticated flight data recorders. Conclusion 34, there you go. Um, and they really didn't hold back. They, they, they said that, you know, the, the FAA's failure to require timely and aggressive action on enhanced FDR capabilities 
has significantly hampered investigators in the prompt identification of potentially critical safety of flight conditions and in the development of recommendations to re to prevent future catastrophic accidents. So I'll say they, they, they weren't pulling any punches or, or Jim Hall wasn't. Um, so in response to the FAA, uh, sorry, the, the NTSB recommendations, the, the FAA ordered that all pre-October 91 aircraft be upgraded to 18 parameters. But, um, but Hall called the, the FAA order too little and too slow and that the FAA had failed in its responsibility to the flying public. So you see there's no love lost between um, Hall and McSweeney there. Um, so Tom McSweeney from the, the F FAA responded with, with a list of actions that the FAA had taken, which, which was, to be fair, quite a long list of actions. Um, it just wasn't a particularly quick list of actions. And uh, I, th I think that's where the frustration li lie, or lay. Um, to show you what they were up against, um, this is the rulemaking process, um, and that th this is why things moved at such you know glacial speed. Um, so all the US regs are made and enforced by the FAA. The the NTSB are independent of the FAA and have got no power to make regs. They can only make recommendations. Any recommendations the NTSB make are considered by the FAA and then assessed for the economic input, uh, sorry, impact, and the ability to produce and govern the the, um, the regulation. Um, this process helped by Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee. They work with the FAA and evaluate many factors in resulting in rules that can be technically and economically justified and then feasibly implemented and, regulation, and regulated. So th this might come as a shock to, to, to some of you hearing this, that it's not all about safety, it's actually about money as well. Um, it is, um, and, and that's because, you know, at the end of the day, commercial aviation, well, the clue's in the name there, commercial. Um, and if, if regular if regulation is put in place that, that that's going to be financially crippling then airlines will just go under and there'll be no aviation industry left so they, they've got to strike a balance you know they, they, they've got to walk a, a line and it is a fine line between what's safe and what's affordable you know you can gold plate things and, and have you know multi-million dollar fixes but at the end of the day, somebody's going to pay for that, and um, if if it you know if it can't filter through to the ticket price, and the, and the and the flying public just stop flying because you know they're being charged a grand to go from you know A to B, that's the end of the industry. So um, anyway, after that, and the the FAA will issue an NPRM review any comments coming from be before it becomes law on the federal register, and an AD is usually issued to ensure a safe but affordable time, compliance time is set. Again, that's just to make the the the, the rules you know workable. Um, you know, you've got to give the the operators time to to put these things in place. So progress from the FDR specific case was very slow. The uh, the NPRM wasn't issued till uh, the end of '99, and the final action until spring 2002. Um, as far away as 2006, the uh, the revisions to the FDR regs were, were 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 issued as a proposed rule. And the reasons for the slow progress of legislation was the cost of implementation on older aircraft and waiting for technological developments such as the uh, the the DFIDU. Um, and again, I go into that on the on my FDR video to come on stream. Um, you you can see here if you if you you know pause and read it, but I'll I'll save you the effort. Um, para two here says that older seven three sevens were excluded on cost grounds. For a seven three seven one to five hundred series, it costs an average of one hundred sixty thousand dollars to meet the NPRM's requirement for aircraft that have a, a, a digital flight data acquisition unit, and a cool four hundred twenty five thousand for aircraft that don't. Now. On a 737 one or 200, that's a significant part, a chunk of the ticket price of the aircraft. Um, so, you know, uh, operators are just not going to foot that bill. The, you know, it's it's never going to happen. Um, the, the FAA came back with the, the saying, data presented by our commentators led to our conclusion that to limit the applicability of this rule to 737s manufactured after 2000, um, as indicated by Boeing, these aircraft were equipped and manufactured with additional parameters. 
we chose that date so as not to introduce yet another date into the existing FTR regs that were adopted in 97. So it seems like a fairly thin excuse, but the bottom line is money. Um, as I say, it's that line between affordable and safe. And just to show that CVR data is still an issue today, or lack of it, uh, really need look no further than the um, the report into the Transa 737200 that ditched off Honolulu in, in July 2021. So that's only, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, well, in fact, two years ago, almost to the day. Uh, the FDR for that aircraft recorded just 18 parameters, and that was fully in accordance with FARs for a pre-October 1991 aircraft. Right, a quick mention about Flight Ops Tech Bulletin um, that was issued it first issued in May 2002, and that's where that fits into the timeline. Um, this was actually nothing to do with rudder problems on the 737, um, but it seems to be at first glance. So I'll, I'll I'll just take you through this in one page. So it was uh, it was issued by Boeing to all airliners, but all all Boeing built air airliners. Um, Seattle and Long Beach. Um, so use of rudder on transport category aircraft now, and this came about uh, following the, um, I don't know if you remember, the Flight American 587 which was an, an A300 which, um, which, which crashed following a large rudder input. So Boeing issued this flight protection bolt to all uh, types cautioning uh, the use of large rudder inputs at high speed. Um, it was about 15 pages long, this technical bulletin, and discussed cyclic um, inputs, fin loads during a side slip, and the effect of speed on, on rudder input and deflection. Um, and certainly caught my eye, because obviously doing air tests, one of the things we, we, we checked was a, was a rudder doublet for the um, first test of the yaw damper. So, um, you know, at, 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 I'll say high speed, at cruise speeds, uh, you know, decimal seven six or seven seven or what have you. Uh, we will put in a rudder doublet. Um, uh, so this this was was quite an eye catcher. But but Boeing say there has been no catastrophic structural failure of a of a Boeing airplane due to pilot control input in over forty years of commercial operations involving more than three hundred million flights. Um, and this bulletin was reissued in November 2011 to include the, the 787. So all it's saying is, you know, be gentle with the rudder input at high speed because you, you might snap the tail off. There you go. Final thoughts. Um, you'll probably be pleased to hear. Uh, it's been a long presentation, but hopefully you found it useful. Um, the chap on the right in the photo is Mike Hewitt. He is an extremely well-respected and experienced Boeing 737 test pilot. Um, I've got nothing but admiration for this guy. Um, he, he he first flew many of the 737 series and, um, and, and developed a lot of Boeing aircraft. He said in an interview in 2008, which I suspect might have been after he left Boeing, but I'm not sure, um, Otherwise, he perhaps might not have been as unguarded in his statement. Um, that, that, this, this, this was in an interview he gave, so I've, I've reproduced this verbatim. These are his, his, his exact words. He said, I don't believe the 737 had a rudder problem. We probably ran that Pittsburgh scenario in the sim a hundred times. We did everything but drop the PC off a 50-story building and it didn't fail. They did try freezing the unit. They managed to get it to fail when a Boeing engineer jammed on the rudder after we'd shot boiling hydraulic fluid through the PCU. The NTSB thought they had the solution, although this kind of scenario is impossible in a 737NG. But a later test we did, uh, we, we did measure the temperature of the hydraulic fluid in actual flight and found it was near zero in the Pittsburgh aircraft, not minus 35 like the test and the Pittsburgh aircraft crashed in summer from 9,000 feet where it was much warmer. I believe a rotor cloud toppled the Colorado Springs aircraft, not the rudder. So that's his view, and, and that's... <laughs> it's quite understandable, given all of the, uh, the work they did to find what happened um, 
with 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 the rudder in the in, in the accidents. I mean that engineering test evaluation board were, was extremely thorough. You 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 heard Boeing say that they they invested seventy five thousand engineering hours into it, couldn't find what was wrong. They they recovered the damaged parts from the from the accident site and couldn't find a failure mode. I mean it was a real mystery. They were working with limited information because of the inadequacy of the of the flight data recorders. Um, anyway, in, in, in the end, the PCU design was changed and there's been no further accidents since, so it probably was that. Okay, so I promised you my view on what happened to those uh, 737s and for what it's worth, uh, here it is. I believe both aircraft were, uh, were, were initially uh, put into an upset condition by when the first place rotor and on, uh, on Pittsburgh by weight turbulence from the, from the 727 that it, it was following. I think that is, is fairly universally agreed. So that, that was the event initiator. However, where it gets interesting is that both of those upsets should have been easily recoverable by crew. There, there are situations that the, the, the crew encounter and, and you know, that were, they should be able to take them in their stride. Um, they didn't. Why? I personally believe that the, w during the recovery pr process, the crew applied a rudder input and because of a previously unknown failure mode in the 737 rudder system, the rudder went to a hard over in the opposite direction to that demanded by the crew. Now that is uh, the, the NTSB position as well. So where do you go from there? Compounded with that rudder reversal hard over, both of those aircraft were at or, or, or maybe below the crossover speed. Now the crew, neither crew, will have known of the existence of a crossover speed, much less had any training to recover from it. So having found themselves in a, in a reverse rudder situation, they did not have the knowledge or the training to deal with that event and recovery was virtually impossible which tragically was, was, was what happened. Now, um, some people have, have said that, that these accidents of the early 1990s were the, the, the MCAS events of their day. Um, and, and parallels have been drawn between Boeing's behavior over MCAS and, and, and over this. I think that is unfair. Um, Boeing invested over 75,000 man hours in the, in, the, in the investigations and certainly you know, did want to, to, to find out what was going on. Um, obviously there was an element of denial by Boeing that it, that it was the rudder system and, and perhaps they were a little too uh, keen to blame the crew, especially you know, given that uh, crew will, will, will not have, have, have known of the concept of crossover speed and how to recover from it. But anyway, put, putting that to, to, to one side, what, what came out of this? Um, th there were actually several very, very good outcomes. First and foremost, that the, there were no, uh, that the rudder system was redesigned uh, successfully in 2003 and there have been no further rudder events since. So, so that's, a, that's an absolute win. Secondly, the, the rudder procedures were, uh, were, were, were rationalised and simplified, um, as in fact were, were all of the flight control procedures. Um, and furthermore, the entire QRH um, was reformatted into a much more uh, user-friendly format for crew, and that, that this was based on the recommendations of the ETEB. So that's done us all a favour, uh, you know, from 2008 onwards, the, the QRH has been much, much easier to use than it used to be. Thirdly, uh, the, the events saw, well, really prompted the, uh, the acceleration of, of an upset recovery training programme. And this was done uh, 
by jointly by all manufacturers, uh, Boeing, Airbus, and and the others as as well. Um, and this led to a to a rollout, a global rollout of upset recovery training programs for all crew. Um, the the results of which, of course, we, we will we will never really know. Um, but I think it reasonable to assume that, that many, many um, hull losses have been saved because of better upset recovery training available to crew. And finally, um, the, the flight data recorder issue. I mean, if you recall, the, the, the first aircraft that, that went down only had five parameters, as was you know, legal at the time. Um, thanks to a lot of pushing from the NTSB, a bit of pushback from the FAA, but they got there in the end. The, um, and of course, technological improvements you know, with, with, with time. Uh, the, the FDR, modern FDRs now record hundreds of parameters, thereby making the, the task of the investigators uh, much more easy to arrive at a, a quick and accurate conclusion and there, thereby be able to issue um, meaningful, timely, safety recommendations which can prevent similar incidents happening again in the future. So take all four of those things to, together, the, uh, the rudder redesign, the QRH, the upset recovery training and, and FDR improvements, you actually come out of the, these two tragic accidents with, with some great results which, which have probably saved many more lives um, it, 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 from when those things were introduced. That's it. That was the 737 rudder story. If you've enjoyed this video, as always, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so, and share the link amongst your colleagues. If you're feeling particularly benevolent to me, then uh, pick up a copy of the book. It's available in printed or in electronic format, and it's got most of this information in it. Once again, thank you very much for, for watching.